Hello, it's Marion Dorflinger. So, today I'm going to tell you about a very famous Missourian uh, who you don't hear about much anymore, James Buchanan Eads. And he helped... <laughs> he helped keep Missouri in the Union at the beginning of the Civil War, <clears throat> which uh, may very well have made the difference in the whole Civil War. When you uh, when you watch the movies and study the history, very few people read anymore that um, losing Missouri and the Mississippi Mississippi Missouri River complex basically made it so that the South had to fight coming up from the South to the North, and most of the ba big battles that decided the war were fought in the East. But if the Confederacy could have had Missouri in the Mississippi, Missouri, then the Union would have fought, provided that the military knew what they were doing, the Union would have had to fight in the East, um, coming up from the South to the North, and they would have had a, a front on the West. Um, that might have made a big, big difference. Um, and uh, the Confederacy basically lost Missouri irrevocably, without, without doubt, within the first three or four months. And a big part of that is Jim Buchanan Eads, who never fired a shot, never put on a uniform, but he was one of America's greatest engineers in that century. He was a poor boy in Missouri. They'd come here from the East, uh, family had fallen on hard times. Um, so they came west for a new start, and, and he was growing up and uh, had to help take care of a lot of his family. Had a lot of responsibilities for a young man, he needed to make money. And he was on the ball, he was smart, he knew how to make things, I mean, build mechanical uh, contraptions. And he said, where's the money? And everybody in Missouri, especially uh, in the vicinity of St. Louis, said, the big money is going up and down that river. The big money is going up and down that river, hauling that freight north to south, south to north. This river, this river that flows through our state, where the Mississippi meets the Missouri and St. Louis and down, that's where the money is. He said, okay, where where can I make the money? And, they, and he said, well, no, I don't really make, this was in the news all the time. Every time, there were a lot of wrecks and uh, riverboat uh, traffic, steamboats, they went down with a lot, a lot of goods, a lot of treasure laying at the bottom of that river. People wanted, God damn, there's so much money at the bottom of that river, and they could know how to get it. Well, Jamie Buchanan was a guy who figured out how. And he is brave enough and tough enough to not only figure out how, but to do it himself. See, he invented something called um, the diving bell which was basically something that looked like a looked like a beer a beer barrel that had a it looked it could look it had an opening that somehow didn't fill up with water but a diver digging around in the dark on the bottom of that river fighting the current could find valuable stuff on those boats and feel that bell take it to the top feel that bell take it to the top and uh after he got really good at that, and to be good at that, you not only had to invent the right stuff, you had to be tough enough to breathe and work in the dark and put the stuff in the barrel and know that every little change in that river could kill you. I mean, that was a day it was a, you try to imagine the Mississippi, Missouri with hardly any dams and how fast that river could flow and how wide it was, how fast it could change from one day to the next. And he learned how to live there. And once he got really good at salvaging the stuff on the boats, he also figured out how to bring the whole boat up. That kid was that good, that smart. And uh, he impressed some people. They invested money. And when he decided that he had done enough river salvage, he had $500,000 cash in Missouri before the Civil War. Poor boy, he's got half a million dollars cash. So he knows a river 
better than anybody except a few riverboat captains. And the riverboat captains actually called him captain. And uh, according to history, I read he was the only guy who wasn't a riverboat captain who they would call captain. I mean, those guys, those guys loved deeds, not just for what he could do, but because of, uh, he would consult with them. He said, okay, tell me what's going on in this section of the river. Those, he, though, he went to those guys because they knew and thought, this guy is a guy we need to talk to. They, they trusted him. He trusted them. So he understood the river. He had good rapport with the people who ran those boats. They figured out how to get the lost treasure to the top and the boats themselves. And so he, he retired from that with half a million and started his own shipbuilding business in St. Louis, Missouri. So he was a pro-union guy. And uh, this will surprise most people, even a lot of Missourians. Most of the pro-slavery people in Missouri were still pro-union. They didn't want to give up their slaves, but they didn't want to leave the union. They were loyal to the union. And uh, we like to say that that war was only over slavery. Um, and if you want to, you can, and I won't say yes or no, but I will tell you that at the beginning, Lincoln said, I'm, uh, I'm fighting to keep the union together. And he said, if I could do it by keeping the slaves in slavery, I would. If I could do it by setting them free, I would. And if I could do it by freeing some and leaving others, I would. That, that was his rhetoric. And uh, the Missourians who wanted their slaves and wanted to stay in the Union, they either took his word for it or they gambled that the right thing to do was stay in the Union. And uh, there, there was nobody running for any office that was very significant in Missouri who could sell the idea that we're going we're gonna to leave the Union. So if you wanted to get elected governor in Missouri, you had to say, I'm going to keep Missouri in the Union. And the guy who did that, well, the last the last governor before the Civil War started was Claire Warren Fox, but um, he was the um, the perfect crooked politician. He promised, "I'll keep Missouri in the Union," while secretly plotting to do just the opposite. He was making deals with Sterling Price and different different Southern uh, military people that hey, we're, we're, you guys you guys are going to come up into Missouri, and I'll tell you where the arsenal is, and you get you get the weapons. And Missouri won't have any choice. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Missouri doesn't have a choice because we've got a few guns. God, you would you would think that guy grew up somewhere besides Missouri. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't even say that now. I mean, you sure couldn't say it in 1860. That that, that guy, uh, he won an election, but he didn't understand the people that he was supposed to govern, and and he got his ass kicked. He got his ass kicked extraordinarily. With, I mean, he he was gone. He was gone in a very short time, and. And Grant and other generals that wanted to hold the to hold this front, the Western Front, said, uh, "Mr. Eads, what can you do to help us take the Mississippi, Missouri, and keep it? Give us control of this river, so the South doesn't have access to our agriculture, our mules, our manufacturing." And he said, "Well, all you got to do is have a boat that'll take a bullet or a cannonball." I won't sick. Uh, think you can do that? And he said, "Well, I'm, I'm the guy that can try." And uh, uh, this would this would amaze a modern student of engineering. So think how incredible this is in 1860, 1861, whatever. Uh, he said, "Okay, I'm I'm going to build an ironclad boat." He was the guy who came up with the idea of the ironclad boat, and. Within the first three or four months, there were seven ironclads going down the Mississippi, Missouri. And um, within the first few months, the Mississippi, Missouri, from where it starts in St. Louis to Vicksburg, were under Union control. Nobody with any Confederate sympathies could go north on that river from Vicksburg. And uh, that was a lot, that was a lot of shipping lane. That was a lot of industry and, and goods that the South couldn't, uh, couldn't transport. And a great big part of winning the war was taking the Mississippi, Missouri. And Eads figured out how to make a ship, an ironclad that could survive a cannibal and, uh, and a fight with another 
non-ironclad and and take that system all the way to Mississippi, Missouri. And uh, as if that weren't enough, um, um, after the Civil War, St. Louis was realizing that, hey, Chicago's a big go-to place. Now, that, that's where the money is because that's where the railroad goes because we can't bridge the Mississippi where it hits the Missouri. Nobody can build a bridge that will take a railroad train over a river that big and wide and fast. Mr. Eads, can you help us again? Yeah, I'll try. He started in, in uh, 1867. And I'll tell you what, lobbyists then were what lobbyists are now. Um, you know, the people that, that had the boats going up and down the river, they wanted to make a little more money before they let progress proceed. And they said, well, we're, we're going to stop the we're going to stop the railroads running across this part as long as we can. So they lobbied and they wanted um, they wanted a, a bridge so high and the pillars so wide apart that um, no engineer except Eads thought that could possibly be done. They thought that they had won uh, the legislation in such a way that the Mississippi, Missouri could never be bridged and no railroad would ever get over the Mississippi, Missouri, and that the, the, the river boats would have it forever. <laughs> you don't tell a guy like Eads it can't be done, because that's one way to make sure it is. So he started in 1867, and uh, he, did, he did engineering feats that had never been accomplished anywhere. And uh, when, when that bridge was done, people all over the world called that the eighth wonder of the world. That, that bridge is still there. Um, I think if you go look at the arch, you'll see that bridge. And it goes from East St. Louis, Missouri to St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and it had, uh, it had a level for the trains to go over and it had a level for the, you know, for the, for the horses and buggies to go over. And uh, there is, there, that is the oldest remaining bridge over the Mississippi to this day. The bridges that span the Mississippi north of the Mississippi, Missouri, they're gone. But the bridge that James Buchanan Eads engineered, you can go to the arch and see it today. And uh, according to the latest statistics, about 15,000 automobiles cross on that bridge. And that bridge was finished in 1874. And this is 2021, and and um, and uh, about 15,000 motor vehicles cross that bridge every day. So it took a lot of different types of people to keep to keep Missouri in the Union and to get Lee to surrender. The Civil War is not over. They said the South will rise again. It is rising again. Um, we still haven't resolved whether all men are created equal and endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, when those words were written, we said, this is self-evident truth. <laughs> it's so self-evident we shouldn't have to fight about it, right? Um, but we have been fighting about it, and we still are, and we... And, um, and the Civil War will be over when we stop fighting about it. But back to the Civil War. It took a lot of different types to keep us in the Union, in this state. It took a lot of different types to keep, to keep Lincoln fighting that war and for Lee to finally surrender. There were a lot of variables in that war. I mean, a lot of people say this one moment, like when Chamberlain... Chamberlain held Little Round Top. Um, that's the moment, you know, that was God stepping in. That's the moment that we won the Civil War. Or when Lee commanded Pickett's charge, that's the moment the South lost. No, no, no. There was no one moment, and there's no one person. Um, and uh, James Buchanan Eads is, uh, is a man who is not written about in many history books anymore. I don't, I've never seen a movie about him. Any Missouri you see about the Civil War here was just Jesse James and Quantrill and Josie Wells, you know, killing, you know, killing the, you know, the Red Legs and the, and the Yankees. 
Uh, but they don't tell you how important this little state right here, this big state right here where I live, is to that war. They don't tell you that there were only two other states that had more battles than Missouri. Now, the big ones were fought out east, but the most were fought out here in the west, places like this, you know. Um, and, you know, I said that most people that were pro-slavery were also pro-union. Um, that stayed that way, even though the, uh, the Union almost lost its PR because the troops that came to Missouri acted like jackasses and the, the, the local populace felt abused and said, well, let's kill these sons of bitches because they're in our state and they're abusing our people and we don't care which side they're on. This is our people. So... Um, some wars are lost because the PR is lost, and there were uh, there were politicians and and, uh, and and military people saying screaming bloody murder. They said, if if those Union troops don't start treating the the local population like they should, we're going to lose the state after we won it. You know, uh, in the end, forty thousand Missourians fought for the South, and one hundred and ten thousand fought for the Union. So it was a majority when they voted for. Claiborne Fox, and it was a majority that ran his ass out, and he uh, he died, you know, he died in exile, basically, basically an unknown, unimportant person, except for the fact that he he betrayed uh, his sacred oath. Um, uh, the majority wanted to stay in the Union all through the war here, um, and if if the PR battle hadn't been so badly damaged, we probably wouldn't have had forty thousand Missourians fighting fighting for the Confederacy, you know. Uh, you, uh, you, don't, you don't send an, an army in uh, to a place where you want the populace to like you and let your soldiers act like jackasses. I mean, a lot of wars are lost because how you your soldiers conduct themselves in the civilian population. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta be better than you gotta be good with a rifle and you gotta be a good soldier and obey orders. You gotta know how to treat people. You gotta know how to treat people. And that rule holds whether you're fighting a war or selling an insurance policy or sitting here making a video that somebody might watch beginning to end. If you don't know how to treat people, you don't know nothing else that means a goddamn thing in this world. And that's sure enough true in Missouri. I live here. I can show you.